Good evening, everyone. Time for another silver update. So the last time we talked about the silver chart, uh, we were looking at this pennant formation, the support line coming, uh, the resistance line coming down, the support line coming up, and then we drew in this support line at 2850 because that seems to be major support. Now I was predicting, I think we were on the one hour. Were we on the one hour? No, we were all further out to maybe the two hour, maybe actually were we on the four hour? I don't remember. But you can see now on the four hour, we do have a cross in the indicator and we made a bottom. Now I said that that was not, we are not in a trending place yet. We're kind of in a sideways place. The sell signals aren't working, the buy signals aren't working. So we're trending sideways. Uh, that's, a lot of traders use a, a range bound trading strategy, buy the, buy, the uh, buy and then sell the sell. Not anything interesting for long term stackers. So looks like we're testing that rising trend line that I spoke about that we'd probably test first. And if we got through it, we'd get a test of 30. We bounced off it and we're about halfway back. So your guess is as good as mine where we're going here. Looks like we're going up based on the crossover on the four hour indicator. But, you know, each time frame has its own indicator. You can see the daily has not crossed. It's actually just crossing the zero line to the downside. So it's not unusual in these types of formations you'll see it look like it's gonna cross over, rally, and then dump. And it will just be a continuation down, especially when it's through the zero line. Remember I said before, the key points are the crossover to the upside from the bottom, crossover to the downside from the top, and the crossover of the zero line. We're at the crossover of the zero line. Now you can't bounce off the zero line, but if you cut through the zero line, then you're probably gonna get another dump which would be a test of 26. So that would be a great buying opportunity for stackers. So let's look at a couple charts here. We're gonna be talking about the great taking. Now I went and got a list, I don't have it in front of me because it had some kind of block on it, but it was the top 10 companies by market cap. We're talking now with Apple and Nvidia and Google and Microsoft and these, we're talking about two to $3 trillion companies. And it wasn't so long ago that the biggest companies were like three, four, five hundred billion dollars. So the market cap on these companies is gigantic. And I think one that we should probably look at here is BlackRock. And BlackRock is the one that everyone talks about. The conspiracy theorists talk about BlackRock controls the world. Well, it controls the retirement investments of people. BlackRock. BlackRock, Vanguard, Fidelity, and State Street are going to be listed almost every stock you see as the four largest holders. Now, that's going to be exactly what the topic is with the great taking because they're, they're holders for someone else. They're trustees in a sense, but they're not really trustworthy. So we'll get into that when we get into the great taking I wanted to talk about, uh, I've got some quotes here from it, and I wanted to talk about, before we get into it, the too long didn't read. So the too long didn't read is basically this. If you don't hold it, you don't own it. That is, if you wanna get anything out of this book, and we're talking about stocks and bonds in this book, primarily, there are other assets, but primarily we're talking about stocks and bonds. If you don't hold it, you don't own it. And we're going to find out from this book, there is no way to hold it. There used to be a way to hold it. There is no longer a way to hold it. So why would you own something that you can't hold? But uh, a lot of people ask me why I pause my channel. And one of the reasons, there were many reasons, but one of the reasons I paused my channel was that I pretty much said everything that could be said about it. it. It became just a rehashing of everything I'd already said. And it gets kind of boring. 
I don't like uh, the types of headline grabbing titles. You'll see, remember, I'm not going to name any names. But headline grabbing titles, silver is going to go here, or the whole world's going to collapse. Those things get a lot of views, but it just it's just endless. So having said that, that I felt like I'd said pretty much everything I could say on the topic. Uh, this is uh, the first of the Office series that I did, kind of an educational little series about why the financial system is dangerous for investors. And so let's listen to this and then I'll comment on it. Hello, I just spoke to my financial advisor and she told me about the large amount of money I will have from investing when I retire. Really? And what are you investing in? My 401k. And what's in your 401k? Mutual funds, I guess. You guess? You are guessing about your retirement? Well, I really don't know that much about investing. I see. So you really have no idea what you are doing or what you are investing in. But you know that you are going to retire fabulously wealthy? Yes. Congratulations. You are about as ignorant as 90% of the American people. Do you even know what a mutual fund is? Well, no, not really. It is an investment vehicle that combines the returns of various stocks and bonds. Do you know what stocks and bonds are? Well, no, not really. Stocks are pieces of paper which give you partial ownership and voting rights in publicly traded companies. And bonds are pieces of paper which represent the debt obligations of publicly traded companies. Well, is it better for me to own more stocks or should I own more bonds? Neither. You don't own either one of those. But I thought you said my 401k is invested in stocks and bonds. No. Your 401k is invested in mutual funds. I see. Well, aren't they the same thing? No. As I told you, mutual funds are pools of stocks and bonds. So you don't really own the debt or shares of any particular company. Do you know which mutual funds you own? Aggressive growth. That's not a fund. It's a type of fund. So you don't know what mutual funds you own? No. And you don't know what allocation of stocks and bonds they have in them? No. And you don't know the names of the companies whose stocks and bonds they hold? No. And you don't know who the fund manager is, who is deciding where to invest your money? No. I see. But you still think you are going to retire wealthy? The only thing you are going to do is be fleeced by the criminals on Wall Street. But I have been told that mutual funds are the best way to invest for the long term. So how long exactly are you willing to wait? For the past decade, most funds have been flat. That means that, if you had left your money with them since 2000, you'd have nothing to show for it. And adjusted for inflation, you'd be down 30%. You mean against inflation I've lost money? Then how will I save enough money for my retirement? If you are trusting in those crooks and pinstriped bandits on Wall Street, you will likely be left with nothing. Then what should I invest in? Well, you could invest in hard assets like gold and silver, which are a hedge against inflation. Over the same time period that stocks have lost money against inflation, silver is up over 700%. Is there a gold and silver mutual fund I can put my money in? No. And even if there were, it would still just be a piece of paper that can be declared worthless overnight. You need to get physical gold and silver in your hot little hand. But to do that I will need to cash out my 401k. And to do that I would have to quit my job. Correct. Now do you see how the Wall Street crooks and banksters operate? You are getting quite an education. But I'll give you a trick. What is that? If you can quit your job and get that money right now, do it. Don't worry about the 10% penalty. And if you can't quit, put all your 401k money in the safest option, short-term treasuries, and then borrow half of that money from yourself. I am allowed to borrow from my 401k? Yes. You can. Once you've borrowed that money, go out and buy physical silver and gold to protect yourself from the hyperinflation that is coming. Thank you, I will do that today. Excellent.
goodbye. So let's. So our office twerp here. <laughs> he was pretty condescending. Sorry about that. Um, you know, he's basically telling you if you don't hold it, you don't own it. And this is just sort of one step deeper down the rabbit hole, we'll say. So The Great Taking is, in summary, is a book about how worldwide coordination of rehypothecation or um, I can't remember one of the terms that he uses for it. But basically, it's someone holding something for you. So they're in a custodial situation and you, you think you you know you hold your stocks with your broker you think you own them you don't uh, you think you get the certificates in your hand and you think you own them you don't you don't own them and there's no way for you to own them that's the basic summary but let's go through the book I want to start off with now I'm, I'm using the page numbers of the PDF that I have and let's look at that real quick because it's kind of interesting that it's a PDF so the great taking is you can find it covered here on Goodreads. Quite interesting. If you want to go to buy it on Amazon, you can see that it's not on Amazon, or it actually redirects you to something that isn't the same book but with a similar title. So yeah, and we're going to find out when we read it. Uh, not well, you'll find out if you read it, but uh, I, I don't think I covered those parts. But yeah, there were some. There was some repression going on in the publishing of this book. And that's that's the first good sign that uh, someone's probably legit is that they are suppressed by the powers that be. Uh, but we, we did find the great taking. It's actually available online as a PDF. So it's free. You can go and download it and um, just read it yourself. So that's the second, I'm going to say that is the second indication this guy is legit. Now the third indication that he's legit is uh, on page 19, we'll go to that. And he's going to be talking about his history in the financial markets. Basically what this guy did was he's, he, he got brought in to do some financial work for these guys, kind of as a low-level guy. And when they saw, I think it was Ivan Bosky or something like that, when they saw, you know, his talent, you see, he's basically, and we'll see here when Soros comes into the picture, but basically the guy's kind of like a Jimmy Rogers. He's a fundamental investor, certainly not technical. I didn't see anything technical in this, but I'm sure that they use, his te they use technical signals in their fund. But he ran a hedge fund, did something similar to what Jimmy Rogers did in in uh, Market Wizards, go read that, one of the greatest books of all time, in the interview with Jimmy Rogers. And you know, Jimmy Rogers was partnered with George Soros. Jimmy Rogers was the brain. Soros was the power, influence, money uh, sort of thing. Had it split that way. But anyway, he's talking here about uh, a trip that he took when he was managing. He was managing this fund and it was ridiculous stress and 24-7 working. And that's how those things are. But he says... On Thursday, August 27th, I left with my children for a long weekend canoe trip in Canada, this being our only vacation for the summer of 1998. Called the office Thursday morning from canoe livery and was then without access to telephones. While I was away, instructions were given to remove the entire short position protecting the hedge fund from loss. And the employees were called together to announce that I would be leaving the firm. This was all unbeknownst to me as I was enjoying a tiny bit of life with my family. So apparently when he took a vacation, they, they did a coup. Arriving early in the office on Monday, August 31st, I was stunned to learn of what had transpired while I had been in the wilderness. To my further amazement, I was informed that there had been a palace revolt and that from, the moment going, from that moment going forward, I would have unquestioned sole responsibility for the hedge fund. Perhaps this was due to the grim fact that all the hedges had been removed in combination with the imminent possibility of a full-blown market crash. This day would see the largest ever point declines in all market indices, other than the Dow 30, which suffered the second highest point decline in history. Our hedge fund would have lost 10% on that day. However, at the open, I shorted the entire value of the fund. Late in the day, I could see the sheer panic selling. We were then in a position to buy into the panic. I covered the entire short position at the low, only through these extremely stressful moves. 
was the fund miraculously protected from loss, ending the flat on the day. NASDAQ Composite finished down 8.6%. So he goes on and explains the fund. So that uh, is very similar to what you read in Market Wizards. Uh, it has all the ring of truth to it. For me, it looks like this guy was a sort of fundamental gut trader and, you know, Jesse Livermore type, or J Jimmy Rogers type. Uh, Ed Sakota type, uh, it has absolutely the ring of truth. So the next one to show you it has a ring of truth is going to be on page 24. And he's talking about the dot-com bust. And he was taken into a meeting with Soros. I think... That Soros and Rogers had already split up and they went their separate ways. Rogers just continued doing his own investing and Soros, well, we know what Soros did. Um, so he ended up quitting that firm that they tried to oust him from. He, he actually ended up unwinding the firm and I think he paid 325%, uh, returned it to all of the hedge fund clients. And because that can happen in a hedge fund, basically, uh, hedge funds, you invest in them, some of them are closed. They buy permission, they're hard to get into, they only want so many investors. One of the reasons is you can move the market against yourself. And he goes into, if you want the long read, read it yourself. He goes into various strategies he uses for not moving the market against himself, certain position strategies, all kinds of stuff like that. But it all has the ring of truth. And he's talking about when the firm folded up, he's going to go out and start his own firm. And that's how it works. You have a reputation. So he had a reputation. He's, one of his former clients called immediately and offered to back me with a billion dollars, explaining that I then would not need to raise money. It was an extraordinary moment for me. I was hugely flattered, but ended up declining the offer when I learned of a side letter that would have put the other clients at a disadvantage. So basically, this guy who was going to fund the money to start another hedge fund was going to give himself an advantage as opposed to the other investors. While the dot-com bust was underway, I was asked to meet with George Soros at the offices of Soros Management New York. I carried into the meeting a single piece of paper. This is a graph showing what the growth rate of the U.S. capital spending had blown through five standard deviations above the mean. Having never in history broken above three standard deviations, I explained that this meant there would inevitably be a historic bust. Soros looked closely at the piece of paper, looked up at me and said, this is good. He studied the paper further, looked up at me again, this is very good. He did not disagree with me about the bus, but said, they cannot allow the equity culture to fail. I said, what can they do that they haven't already done? He said, in answer, you don't know what they can do. So in such a moment, even George Soros spoke of they. Very interesting. So that's another just little bit of information that tells me this guy is legit. So now I'm going to read some quotes. I didn't put the pages on here. We'll go down to the pages again. But these are just quotes on the way. So he's now starting to suss things out. And these little incidents are going to be things that he sees. Uh, so in March, this is the Fed getting involved. In March 2003, I started seeing a phenomenon I'd never seen before. On individual days, everything went up with no apparent source of the fund flows. There was no rotation. All sectors went up, as did bonds. This was not being driven by open market operations because money supply growth was falling. Something unprecedented was happening in the internals of the market. The only explanation was that created money was now being directly injected into the financial markets. I wrote about this at the time. So he's seeing an indication now that the Fed is, is behind the scenes and I think I've reported on that probably half a dozen times, whether it's mysterious banks in the Caymans or all over the world, the Fed doing what they do. Uh, again, this is nothing new, but this is him getting a clue as to what's happening. Uh, the next little snippet here is where he notices that they're lying about the stats. In the spring of 2004, I was preparing to write this in my quarter letter when I found out the DLQT4 index in the Bloomberg system had been changed to instead show that foreclosures were going straight down. This is when the mortgage crisis was just hitting. I asked one of the guys on the desk to dig into what had been done to the data series. He called in the agency responsible 
for the data. And eventually he was told, well, the data series had been calculated consistently in the same way since 1970s, methodology had recently been changed and this change had been applied retroactively. Sound familiar? This is what I told you, Silver Institute. You can look up their documents and there are retroactive changes on the silver numbers. Indeed, the methodology was now being tweaked with each data release. Doing so made it possible to publish any desired trend line. So and that's him seeing that they're cooking the data. Now this is a little snippet about counterparty risk. He says, I could see that this coming global collapse would be much bigger than the dot-com bust. And I began to worry that the insolvencies would be so enormous and widespread that the prime brokers, the custodians for our hedge funds would fail. If you're using shorts, your assets are pledged in a collateral account. There's no way to be hedged without being exposed to the failure of the prime broker. I often awoke in the middle of the night and knowing that I could not get back to sleep would simply get up and continue working. So this is pretty frequent with traders. If you read Market Wizards, you'll see they have to get up in the middle of the night. But the, And I think the quote from Jesse Livermore, the guy said, I'm, Mr. Livermore, Mr. Livermore, I'm carrying so much cotton I can't sleep at night. And Livermore replied, or he's quoting an old trader that replied this, saying, sell down to the sleeping point. So basically, reduce your risk down to the point where you can sleep. Now, the reason why he couldn't sleep is because even though he was short the market, remember that his shorts were in a collateral account. So if the holder of that account goes bankrupt, he loses, even though he's right. I think Livermore said, there's the unexpected and there's the unexpectable. Well, after reading The Great Taking, you're, you're not going to be able to say anymore that this is unexpectable or even unexpected. He's telling you straight up, they're going to take the money. They already have. So that's him waking up to the counterparty risk. Uh, then I labeled this one the big clue about what's what they're actually doing. In 2008, I noticed the failure of a small broker dealer in Florida, and I was shocked to learn that the client's assets owned outright with no borrowing against them were swept to the receiver and encumbered in the bankruptcy estate. I had to understand how this could possibly have happened. Eventually, I un uncovered the ownership right to the securities, which have been personal property for four centuries, had somehow been subverted. This would be borne out further in the bankruptcies of Lehman Brothers and MF Global. So this is, we, we've seen other, we've seen it other times before with GM, where they ripped off the bondholders, they, the breaking of the rule of law, the subversion, it's, it's been going on quite some time, even back in the 90s with long-term capital. Anytime the Fed step in and bail people out, it's not transparent. It's, it's, it's really dirty business. And so the last one I put here is correct motive, uh, his motive for writing the book. He says, I've not wanted to write this book or have anything to do with this, but it's become unavoidable. It is like exercising a demon which has plagued me and my family. It must be done, and then I will be done. I am self-publishing this because I don't want to involve a lot of people. I just need to get it out. I expect that there will be efforts to criticize me personally and this work. So let's go through the rest of it. I'm just going to read snippets out of it, and then I'll give you a summary. Uh, so we'll jump to page 34. And this is his summary. What is this book about? It's about the taking of collateral, all of it, the end game of this globally synchronous debt accumulation super cycle. This is being executed by long planned intelligent design the audacity and scope of which is difficult for the mind to encompass, included are all financial assets, all money on deposit at banks, all stocks, all bonds, and hence all underlying property of all public corporations, including all inventories, plant and equipment, land, mineral deposits, inventions, intellectual property, privately owned and personal and real property, financed with any amount of debt, keep that in mind, any amount of debt, will be similarly taken, as will the assets of privately owned businesses, which have been financed with debt. If even partially successful, this will be the greatest conquest and subjugation in world history. So that's what he says is coming. Sorry. Uh, we'll go to 43. And 
43 is rehypothecation. We've talked about that before. Essentially, all securities owned by the public are owned by the public are in custodial accounts. Pension plans, investment funds are now encumbered as collateral underpinning the derivatives complex, which is so large an order of magnitude greater than the entire global economy that there is not enough of anything in the world to back it. The illusion of collateral backing is facilitated by a daisy chain of hypothecation and rehypothecation in which the same underlying client collateral is reused many times over by a series of secured creditors. And so it is these creditors who understand this system who have demanded even more access to client assets as collateral. And page 49, you are going to be the last in line. In other words, we saw this, I think we saw it in Greece, uh, we've seen it in other bankruptcies in the past, but he talks about how the ordinary Joe is going to be the last in line. What was the purpose of seemingly this, of seemingly out of control financialization? The threat of financial collapse and the promise of continued financial profits have been used to herd the nations. An imperative has been created that certain secured creditors must be given legally certain claims to client assets globally without exception with the further assurance of near instantaneous cross-border mobility of legal control of such collateral. The global push for the conformance to the U.S. model for achieving such legal certainty and mobility began in earnest more than 20 years ago in the aftermath of the dot-com bust. Financial instability and the threat of collateral shortages were used as a justification. Deliberate efforts were sustained globally over many years People were paid to do this, to betray the vital interests of their own people. It was done first in the U.S. and then demanded globally under the name of harmonization. And there's a whole chapter on that. Perhaps the emphasis should be on harm. And then he's going to go in. He goes into a long historical um, bit. I'm sorry, what page was that? goes into the Great Depression and talks a little bit about what a lot of people don't know about the Great Depression and the bank holiday. It talks about his aunt. I'll just read the whole thing. My Aunt Elizabeth had been 10 years old when the banks were closed by executive order in 1933. When I asked her to tell me about the Great Depression, she said that suddenly no one had any money, that even wealthy families had no money and had to take their daughters out of private school because they could not pay the tuition. I wondered why even these wealthy families could not send their children back to the schools after the banks were reopened. The answer is that only the Federal Reserve Banks and banks selected by the Federal Reserve were allowed to reopen. The Federal Reserve Banks, writes Alan Meltzer, sent the Treasury lists of banks recommended for reopening and the Treasury licensed those it approved. Meltzer's study, A History of the Federal Reserve, is considered the most comprehensive history of the central bank. People with money in banks that were not allowed to reopen lost all of it. Their debts were not canceled, however. These were taken over by the banks, selected by the Federal Reserve System. If these people could not make their debt payments, which was now likely, since they had lost their cash, they lost everything. They had finance with any amount of debt, their house, their car, their businesses. Thousands of banks were never allowed to reopen. So, if you think about it, if these people had money, they kept their money in the bank and they had debts, but they also had assets. So what essentially happened was they took their assets by closing the bank because the bank was insolvent, but they didn't cancel their debts. They took those debts and sold them to the new banks that would be open in the Federal Reserve System. A lot of people didn't know, a lot of people don't know that that's what they did in the Great Depression. So on page 89, we're going to talk about CBDCs. Now, I've talked about CBDCs myself. He's going to talk about it to try to talk about what they have planned. Uh, CBDCs, the, the whole thing is a complete ruse. It's nonsense. It has absolutely nothing to do with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. CBDCs are a centralized um just completely centralized system, digital system, 
which we already are on. That's what the whole battle of the SWIFT system is. This is a centralized digital system. 99% of payments already are digital. So this is just a revamping of the digital payment system. And they call it CBDC because they're trying to piggyback on the idea of Bitcoin. But it has absolutely nothing to do with Bitcoin because Bitcoin is an idea for a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer money, not what they're talking about here. But anyway, he's talking about how they're going to try to roll out CBDCs as a result of this crash he's talking about. Why is this happening now globally? Is it really a desire to bring financial inclusion to the disadvantaged? Why would the Atlantic Council, Council a military strategy think tank, focus on CBDC? We are living within a global hybrid war, a component of which will be the collapse of the banking, money, and payment systems globally. War aims will be achieved by means other than kinetic war. The foremost aim of the people who have privately controlled the central banks and money creation is that they will remain in power forever. They can risk no pockets of resistance. And he goes on to talk about the BIS. Now, in page 93, he's going to talk about deflation. And so apparently he is not in the hyperinflationary camp. I tend to be in the hyperinflationary camp. But I mentioned in the last video that... Sil uh, that silver is a, is primarily a deflation hedge, a default hedge, and that's deflation. That's when people are going bankrupt. That's when counterparty risk comes in. That's when rehypothecation comes in. That's when all these things come in. So he says, when the everything bubble is imploded, we will face a deflationary depression which will span many years, even decades. This coming great deflation is intrinsic to the great taking. The architects of the great taking have planned and prepared to use this dynamic fully this dynamic fully, securing their knowledge that as night follows day, massive and prolonged deflation will certainly follow the epic debt expansion supercycle, which they created. The architects have assured that they alone are positioned to take everything and that you and your children are positioned on the other side of that, to lose everything, to be enslaved and even destroyed. People will be knocked down and will not be able to get up again. This is intentional. And we'll go ahead and read the conclusion that's on page 100. And then I'm going to summarize. So he's talking about the big they. If the people behind this great taking persist in their insane schemes, they will inevitably be found. It will be quite simple to follow the collateral to you to those who have arranged to take it. Perhaps they aren't such masterminds after all. We will come to know who is behind this hybrid war against humanity. We will come to know who controls the Bank of International Settlements, the Federal Reserve System, and all the centrally bank, central banks globally, and hence all the political parties, governments, media, and armed forces. We will know, come to know who controls the CIA, and we will finally know who's been behind the assassinations. Main quotes Kennedy. So that's the end of the book. Um, what's the takeaway? I think the guy is legit. And what he's saying is true. I think it's been true for quite some time. If you remember, a lot of people talked about the DTCC. He goes into the DC, DTCC. This is basically a clearinghouse where all your stock and bond certificates are held. Remember back in the day, they had a fire on Water Street at the DTCC building, you know, buildings blowing up and all the records being destroyed. It goes all the way back. Um, nothing new, nothing new. But uh, more information about what we already knew is that if you don't hold it, you don't own it. And so the only question you have to ask yourself is if you don't hold it and you don't own it, then what are the things you can hold? That's really the only question you have to ask. Now, what can you hold in your hand? Well, we're talking precious metals, silver and gold. There really isn't any other kind of money you can hold in your hand. Do you hold cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin in your hand? No, it's just digital. You can have a, a piece of that ledger that only you know and you have the private keys as long as the coin is not compromised or broken somehow, which hasn't happened yet.
but you certainly don't hold it in your hand. Can you hold a stock certificate in your hand? Yes, you can actually order the paper shares, but they're not, uh, it, it doesn't stand up in court. So even though you might have that thing plastered to your wall, 10,000 shares of such and such mining company, uh, when push comes to shove, you're gonna find out that there are senior stockholders that are preferred above you and all kinds of different legal variations. Um, can you hold real estate in your hand? Well, no, not really. You can live on it, but you still have to pay taxes on it. Can you hold preps in your hand? Yeah, that's probably the closest thing. Maybe preps and ammo, but how much preps can you stack up? Your food's going to go bad. How much ammo do you want? Do you really want to buy and sell ammo? I don't think people really want to do that. So it pretty much leaves you with gold and silver. Now, I personally like silver a lot better than gold just because I think that silver is still a precious metal or they wouldn't be suppressing it and that it is uh, way undervalued compared to gold, although I believe gold is way undervalued compared to the debt that's out there. So just goes back to the old uh, office series and back to the channel. Now, the original motive was silver for the people, which is the idea that if the people decide to stack enough silver in mass, whether it's people, countries, it doesn't matter. We saw from the document, the WikiLeaks document, that it could be a rogue country. But if enough rogue players, we'll call them, <laughs> just ordinary Joes, start stacking physical silver and gold, then they can force an end to the system. Now, I don't think that's the scenario we're in. I think we've seen the years that I've been gone, I've seen that you know, people are much more easily brainwashed than we thought, and they're much harder to wake up. I think it was Mark Twain that said, uh, it's much easier to fool someone than to convince them that they have been fooled. I think we're seeing that with a lot of things recently. So I'm coming to the same conclusion I came to many, many years ago, and that's that... The only way to protect yourself from what is coming is going to be physical precious metals. And we'll talk to you next time.